Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace Thank you for using Global Tail Link Hey, Pete, man. Hey, Sam. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm doing great. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, talking about your mission tonight. Um, before we go on, I want to give uh, people a little bit of background. Uh, first off, I want to congratulate you on recently obtaining your BA degree from CSULA. Yeah, it's my wife's. Uh, my wife is a fellow alumni of that great school as well. So I uh, definitely want to want to definitely send you a big congratulations. Oh, that's awesome! Golden yeah. Eagles fly high, man. Yes, Thank sir. You very yeah, much. yeah. Uh, well, to let everybody know out there, um, for 24 years now, Samuel has, uh, who was convicted for attempted murder in Sacramento, has been serving time in California state prisons. Right now, he is at a correctional facility in Lancaster. And a couple of interesting things about him that I would love to discuss. Uh, the first one is he played a major role in working with representatives and activists to put together legislation to end slavery in California prisons. We'll talk more about that in a bit, Sam. But um, before leaving Lancaster, you were doing time at New Folsom. And uh, while there, you drafted a successful intervention plan to combat the high homicide and suicide rate. Um, since authorities implemented this plan, there have been fewer deaths at New Folsom. Can you explain the 10P program and how you came up with that? Yeah, um, thank you for asking. And it's an honor to be here, first and foremost. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing. Thanks. But not only people um, similarly situated as myself, but for humanity as a whole because this is needed to bridge the gap and, and help us all evolve in our shared humanity. So thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. So, yeah, the 10P program, it, it was created from my personal experience. As you stated, in New Folsom, there were a great deal of homicides and suicides, and people felt like they had nothing to live for. And when I mentioned this to my then-supervisor, Sheila Castro, she told me, you know, she challenged me and told me to do something about it. So I drafted the proposal. And so 10P stands for a prisoner's parole portfolio is positive programming and prior preparation that prevents a poor performance. And initially, it was about helping the individuals fill their portfolios with positive accomplishments that they could be proud of. And what you would see, and, and I took this from my own personal experience because I had my portfolio and I carried it everywhere I went. It was like a force field. It was like a force field walking through that war zone, through that yard, and the last thing I wanted was to lose it. Or, or to have a blemish on my record. So I wasn't going to get into any any altercations. I wasn't going to get into any disciplinary infractions. And it it had the same meaning to everyone else as they got into the program. The portfolio became, they're, they're, it's like the Holy Grail. Being found suitable is like the Holy Grail. And the portfolio is critical to accomplishing that mission. So the 10 program was really about effectuating emotional literacy in the participants. Uh, something that I found is that emotional literacy is synonymous with pro-social behavior, which is directly opposite of emotional illiteracy and anti-social behavior, which is the linchpin of criminality. So the ultimate goal was to help men become emotionally illiterate to restore that, something that we all lost in our, in our early childhood, probably due to adverse childhood experiences and trauma that we didn't know how to process. Wow. Well, thank you for that, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who uh, thank you as well. And you carried that over to Lancaster, where you are currently as well? Yes, man. Um, so we showed up, and I, I drafted the proposal, and I presented it to the community resource manager, Erica Lay. And after smoking it over for like a year and assessing my character, she decided to approve it. And it was, it was so welcomed here that over 800 people signed up. It broke a record, and it now has a 10-year waiting list. <laughs> just to get inside the program, which is indicative of the fact that, you know, we need to spread it to as many institutions as we, as we possibly can, which is ultimately one of the goals. And so this, the 10 piece system, quickly I'll just tell you, the 10 piece system is seminars, workshops, activities, and groups. And so we have the Dwight Men Workshop, the Life Empowerment Group, the Parole Preparation Workshop, the Survival Offender Mediation Seminar, and the Brain Project. All of these are components 
of the Stampede program that the participants transition to, and it targets key aspects of their lives. Like the Boys to Men workshop may deal with peer pressure, um, time management, setting educational goals on cell phone addiction. Whereas in the Survival of Fender Mediation Seminar, it's more restorative justice based. It will actually do mock mediation or bring you face to face with the survival of a crime and help develop empathy and bridge gaps to erase prejudice and stereotypes that many of us walk into the prison setting with or change the views of those who have never actually encountered someone who was incarcerated, convicted of a heinous crime, and, and actually humanize people who are in prison and let them see that we're all so much more than our worst decisions or our last mistakes. So. Wow. Well, I want to get into one of your main missions. Explain for the majority of people out there who just don't know how slavery exists through the prison system. All right, that's a great question. So the popular narrative is one in which slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment and nothing could be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is slavery was merely conditioned and what it was conditioned on was incarceration or to take it back a notch and say due process. So due process is the mechanism that they utilize to transform any person from the street into a modern-day slave. If they bring you to a court system and they say, well, you received due process and you were found guilty by a, you know, a jury of your peers of a felony, and we're going to sentence you to the California Department of Corrections, or any Department of Corrections for the most part, with the exception of Colorado, Utah, and um, I believe it's Nebraska, who have already overturned uh, their exclusionary clauses in their constitution. For the majority of the other states, once you're convicted, you're now, um, based on the Constitution, Article 1, Section 6 of the California Constitution, able to be subjected to involuntary servitude, which means that they can give you any job and you are not allowed to say no. And if you say no, then you get the equivalent of what's called the a 115 or a disciplinary report, which I like the fact is fancy to the modern day whip. I, that was just and what I was thinking. With that, Damn. Yeah, that's the modern day whip. Mm. And it's so significant because the, you know, the whip of antiquity, it would rip the flesh on your back and leave these scars and possibly beat you to death. And that's terrible. Make no mistake about it. The more contemporary whip of today will find you going to the parole board and receiving a 15-year denial, a 10-year denial, a 7-year denial, a 5-year denial, or best-case scenario, a 3-year denial, which is basically an entire another life, life sentence. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And so this is what involuntary servitude looks like today. You know, you have men and women working inside of these prisons who are not getting paid or they're getting paid 8 cents an hour or so, uh, sometimes like 10 cents an hour, to do jobs that keep the prison standing. That without these jobs and without these laborers, prison systems couldn't function the way it does. And the people who are really benefiting are not the public. Like, it's not about public safety. It's not about rehabilitation. But it's really about lining the pockets of the private prison corporations and, and their allies that are responsible for passing tough on crime legislation all throughout the nation. But it's floated as public safety and just deserves for people who committed crimes. But really, you're taking an already traumatized group of people from marginalized backgrounds, traumatizing them more, destroying their communities, and filling the coffers of corporations who benefit from the prison industrial complex. That's what it looks like today. Mm. And what made you want to attack this? Well, I'm a, I'm a healthcare facility maintenance worker here in the prison, and I was the first person in the state who had to enter a COVID-19 cell and disinfect it and sanitize it. Wow. And exactly, man. Mm. And it was so surreal because the nurses, no one knew what to expect. All we know is that, you know, what I can tell you is that overcrowded prisons and mass incarceration is a smorgasbord for a pandemic. Mm -hmm. it, it can't be good. With us stacked on top of each other, with us having recycled air inside these buildings, with the inadequate PPE, the 
So when we talk about a pandemic, because I like to study history, I thought about influenza 1918, 1919. I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's about to happen during my lifetime. So I was terrified, but I have this job. I'm a frontline worker. And the nurses and everyone rushed this guy out. He was on life support. They left the machines plugged up and whizzing inside the cell. Mm. Um, there was bodily fluids inside of the cell and, and dirty, you know, underwear and everything inside of the cell. And they just ran out. And I was tapped with going in there to, to disinfect these machines, to unplug everything, to clean up behind this guy, to get the bodily fluids up. And I didn't know what to expect. So I did it. I did it. And there was another incident where staff member tested positive and had to go clean that as well. But I didn't want to continue going to work and risking my life for 35 cents an hour, you know, versus COVID-19. And so I told my supervisor, I'm like, hey, man, um, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I would like to take some days off, you know, and the first day they, they thought I was joking, so they laughed at it. But once they seen that I took a couple of days off, then they told me, no, you have to report to work. You have to do this job. You have to go risk your life. You know what I mean? Mm. And when I told my wife, she was terrified, of course. And we were already members of the Abolished Slavery National Network that's striving to get this same feat accomplished in like 30 states throughout the nation. And so with that, we decided, well, it's time for us to spearhead the movement here in California. And per encouragement of my wife, Jamelia Land, I wrote the amendment to the California Constitution. I mailed it out to her. She did all of the legwork all throughout the Capitol, speaking to senators and assembly members that she knew. And then assembly member Sidney Camlago, who is now a senator, picked it up. Because she felt it, and she agreed that there's no reason why slavery should still be on the books, or involuntary service schools should still be on the books in 2021. Especially seeing how Colorado, Utah, and Nebraska um, constituent voters felt the same, and they, they they did away with it. So how are we going to be in the most progressive state, you know, one of the most progressive states, the leader in the nation, and we not get rid of involuntary service schools? So that's how that came about. It was based on the work that I was doing, being was taking place around me, being terrified, talking to my wife, and then also picking up the torch to do here in California what we're also working to do throughout the entire state uh, nation on a federal level. Mm. Yeah. We'll probably get the 60-second warning here pretty soon, so I'd love to talk about uh, your nonprofit organization. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the co-founder of the anti and Safety and Accountability Project, also known as ASAP, along with my wife, Janelia Land, and my brother, Aaron Fisher. And we're ultimately geared towards just effectuating positive change in as many spaces as possible, dealing from community violence to the inequality within the prison setting to offering educational opportunities to at-risk youth and the formerly incarcerated. So my wife does a great deal of like outreach for people who lose family members to police violence and, and gun violence in the community. We, we step in as um, emergency trauma specialists, if you will, for people who don't have the resources to deal with such a traumatic event in their life and losing a loved one so suddenly. We're there for them. She serves as a conduit between the families and the police officers to make sure that they get all of the evidence that people are held accountable to give them an opportunity to have their voices heard. Um, and it's also the parent of the 10P program operating inside of these prisons and we're seeking to proliferate all throughout the California Department of Corrections. And so some of the things that we've done that we're definitely proud of, in addition to the 10P program and putting forth the California Abolition Act, we recently organized the 58 Commemorative March on Washington in Sacramento, you know, to honor Martin Luther King's March on Washington. That's, you have 60 seconds remaining. So that's just a fraction of the type of work that we do. I love it. Sam Brown, it's been a pleasure talking with you. I hope we can stay in touch, and I'm going to put all your information in the uh, bottom. Um, I guess the last few seconds, are there anybody out there that you want to thank, you know, who's helping you along with your mission? Oh, yeah, man, I definitely want to give all thanks to God first and foremost. Thank you to yourself once again, you know what I mean, for providing this opportunity. And um, thank you to ASAP and our entire California Abolition Act Coalition. 
and a special shout out to my wife and my family and my mom. So with that, thank you, man. And any time I can uh, be of assistance or help, I would love to. Thank you. I'm going to touch base with Perry. I'm going to make sure you and I stay connected, man. It's uh, definitely been a pleasure. Uh, you have a great night, and I'll definitely be in touch, all right? Thank you. Take care, I brother. Love Perry. Peace, man. Peace. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace.